How was it sort of trying to develop a film during the pandemic? What, what challenges did that present? Um, quite a few. You know, I think we were one of the first ones out of the gate. Um, and it was pre-vax, so the protocols were really strict. And um, I think logistically, um, it's hard. You're on a train in a tube. How can you social distance? You know, I think we thought, oh, we're making it all on a stage. It's contained. And then all of a sudden, it's like, oh, but now we're really contained. Maybe we're too contained. Um, but we figured ways around that, ventilation, removing walls, um, things like that. I think those are the logistics. I think um, the creative side of like being able to relate to an actor when you're in a mask as a director is difficult. So I think some of the translation is, a, you know, you just want to like take this crap off and like, you know, express to them, you know, your notes. Um, but we got through it and we had such a talented group of people and it was really cathartic for us mm. to be there during that scary time and we were grateful and having a blast. Yeah, great. So how did you become attached to this project? Because it, it, apparently it was languishing in development hell for quite a while <laughs> with uh, uh, Antoine Fuqua was originally yeah. apparently connected to the project. So how did that come about with you? Yeah, I don't know. I mean. I wouldn't go as far as it was languishing. Um, right. I think um, he had done, he had attached himself and they hired Zach Okowitz to adapt the book and they had gotten the draft out and Antoine's busy, his dance card's really full and so he had stepped off the project because Sony really wanted to make it and they came to Kelly McCormick, you know, my creative producer and um, head of 87 North and she read it, she's like, this is fun. And these are great characters. You should take a look. And I took a look, and I'm like, oh, we, we can do this. Let's dive in. So um, it was pretty quick once we got the script that we thought, let's do it. And then we had, you know, Brad in mind, and Sony had just done Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and they're like, let's give it to Brad as soon as possible. And we um, submitted it to Brad, and he felt the same. And, and, and it was actually a fast train, so to speak, mm -hmm. once I got the script. So also talking about the scripts, because obviously, as a lot of your films uh, are, there, there's quite an irreverent mix of comedy and yeah. extreme violence. But uh, Aaron Taylor Johnson has spoken about the fact that the, the, the project was originally meant to have a much darker, grittier tone. Is, is that true? Or, and if so, like, how did that change well, I come get, about? You know, it's like um, everything. Like, you know, he, he read, you read the script <coughs> and, like, and I read a script and sort of the visions of things can be very different. And I think um, because we were, we were moving at a fast pace, it's like um, an actor doesn't know everything that's in a director's head. I've, like, tonally where I wanted to go. I mean, um, I always wanted to, to be fun and broad, and um, I, the, the original novel is f dark, funny, dark. Right. This is a little bit dark, funny, light, <laughs> you know, and I think that's where I wanted to go because I think we wanted to reach a, a wider global audience, but still do my brand um, of filmmaking, which has comedy and some violence and, and can blend those two things. So um, I wouldn't say that the script was that way at all, but I do think that when we all got together in the crucible of making this movie, we were having so much fun that it did elevate the comedy. And we were, I was letting, I was creating an environment for the actors to go big and broad and like, I knew I could scale it back in um, editorial if I wanted, but I didn't want to. Once I saw their performances and how much fun they were having and it was infectious, I'm like, this is the movie. It's yeah. happening right here. And I remember sitting with um, Aaron next to the monitors and he's looking at it, a couple of him and Brian's sort of improv moments. Cause I think he was trying to find his footing in the character and I'm like, we watched it together and he's laughing out loud at the monitor and I said, I told you, see, this is it, this is it. Like you need to lean into this, like this is Lemon and Tangerine. Do not hold back, make them big, you know, and then we'll pull the rug out and make you feel for them, you know, because we love them so much. Um, and make sure you see their dramatic performances are amazing yeah. as well. Yeah, because they also provide one of the only moments of pathos yeah. in the film, really, which which I find interesting. Talking about uh, the, the the rest of the cast as well, how interesting has the 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 uh, shift from being Brad Pitt's stunt double to his director been? Man, it's kind of like the movie, you know, when the elder says, you know, everything that happens to you has brought you here, you know, and Brad's like, ooh, that's a crap deal, you know, whatever, but uh, everything that's happened to me has brought me here. And I think it was a beautiful experience to work with Brad and a fortunate experience to work with Brad as his stunt double where I could provide support to him building a character 
in the constructs of a movie, right? And now we've come full circle as our careers went different ways. And now that I'm a filmmaker, he's coming in and providing this character that's building support for the my overall movie. And um, it's just a really sort of um, beautiful full circle moment for us. And uh, I love working with him. He's um, he's a great friend. So talking about fate, which is obviously quite a big theme of the movie. When yeah. you when you were doing the media rounds for Deadpool two. You talked about a Domino's character providing a lot yeah. of opportunity for, for like luck-based action sequences. Do you think that that's something that you consciously explored in this film as well? I did. I think you know there's a scene. Um, not to give spoilers, but there is a scene towards the end of the movie where, you know, the characters are fighting in the train, especially Ladybug, and there's sort of this Rube Goldberg, things that are happening that are causing other things to happen and. So we're leaning into sort of that meditation on fate and that no matter what, you know, I think the elders plan, the elders time has come and everybody's his time for justice in the tragedy that happened to him, you know, 30 years ago has come and uh, everyone's destination has brought them here to service that one real agenda, which is the elders revenge, you know, for that tragic night. and. Um, Everyone's playing a piece in that puzzle, and no matter how bad Ladybug's luck is, it's not going to change. You know, so you see all these good luck things happening to him because it needs to get to the final piece of the puzzle so the elder can have his revenge. And I think that's just a sort of like one of those meditations or fables on fate and um, you know how the butterfly effect really does exist in this world, mm -hmm. and you know whether you believe it or not. Just going back to like some of the tropes of your previous movies, because obviously we talked about like the, the, the irreverent mix of comedy and violence. Uh, another thing that's very noticeable about this film is that um, you know urban Japan is portrayed in a sense of sort of heightened reality. Yeah. You know, it's highly stylized, yeah. and that's uh, that's something that has characterized um, John Wick and Atomic Blonde yeah. to an extent as well. Um, do you think that cinema works best when it's on that kind of heightened plane of reality? No, I think cinema works in a lot of different ways. You know, I'm incredibly compelled by super grounded, um, realistic portrayals of, you know, you know, whatever drama, comedy, action. Um, I think the work that I do, um, in these last, in this sort of like list of films, you know, my first sort of chunk out of the gate it has been creating universes, right? And creating a little heightened universe so you can escape into it and you can have fun. You can have sort of the fun with a little bit of the sadistic violence and you can have fun with the dark humor and you can have fun, you know, with the irreverence and you know it's not reality, you know? But there's still the pathos. Um, there's still a, um, a reflection of reality that you can, I can still give you a moral message if, uh, if you want to take it you know, like Deadpool 2 or Hobbs and Shaw, like when things go real south, you want to like head home to your family mm -hmm. and they're going to protect you more than anybody. Um, but again, we're having them in this sort of comic book way. And that is just my sensibilities that, that during these last, you know, you know, 10 years as I've been making movies, um, I like going to the cinema to escape. Um, and again, as a, as a viewer, I also like to see other types of cinema. And I don't think one is better than the other. Do, do, I mean, do you ever see yourself making a kind of Ken Loach style sort of grounded yeah. social? You do. I do. I mean, I, sometimes it would it'd be beautiful. I just would need to read. I need to read the material and I need it to speak to me and not to sound like a, a jerk. But I need to know that I can make it. You know, I yeah. think um, when that script comes to me and I read it and I have I initially know like, oh, I know how to make this. And um, sometimes I read great scripts and I'm like, oh, I don't know how to make this. Mm -hmm. And there's I know there's other people that can make this better than me. Then I let it go, even if it's good material. Like, because I really want to. You spend so much time on a movie. You want to know, like, you're investing in something that you can you can do well. At least yeah. I do. Thank that you so great, much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank